As 1910 opened a new decade, drum beats of war could be heard rumbling across the European continent. The inevitable moved one step closer with the death of the man known as Edward the Peacemaker, King Edward VII of England. While the world waited in an uneasy peace, discovery and progress continued. Two heroic teams of explorers staged a race towards the South Pole. One of the engineering marvels of the 20th century was unveiled in Panama, while another engineering wonder would be lost at sea when the unsinkable Titanic met its fate. This tragedy would be dwarfed by the terrible events that followed the assassination of an archduke and his wife in Sarajevo. Soon, nearly all of civilization would be reeling from some of this century's most devastating days. On May 6, 1910, the world lost one of the last deterrents to war. Edward the Peacemaker was dead. Edward VII, King of the British Empire, Emperor of India, and one of the most popular leaders of his time, had died suddenly of pneumonia. Edward ascended the throne at a time when tensions were high in Europe due to entangling alliances and imperial rivalries. Edward's mother, Queen Victoria, had given birth to eight other children who all married into other royal families. This gave Edward relatives throughout the courts of Europe. Edward was everybody's favorite uncle. His diplomacy, strength, and personal magnetism helped to calm the waters and strengthen bonds in the dysfunctional family of European royalty. As the darkening clouds of World War I appeared on the horizon, Edward's diplomatic gifts proved invaluable. In the nine short years of his reign, England's isolation had given way to a series of political attachments with two old enemies, France and Russia, and one promising new power, Japan. The resulting power shifts reverberated around the world and affected every country's relations with every other. England's new friendships caused particular concern to Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II. Wilhelm felt that Edward, his mother's brother, threatened Germany's alliances and its dream of European domination. But on May 6th, when the announcement of King Edward's death was made, the Kaiser secretly rejoiced. Wilhelm joined his English relatives and royal representatives from 70 countries in saying farewell to his nemesis. With Edward's death, his nephew was free to consider himself the supreme power in Europe. Edward VII's death brought an end to a tranquil time of peace and prosperity. He may have been the only man in Europe with the power and influence to help prevent war. Without Edward's calming presence, however, the royal mixture of blue blood and politics would soon turn to red as war engulfed the continent. On October 10, 1911, an uprising in the Chinese city of Wuchang quickly escalated into a widespread revolt against the ruling Manchu dynasty all across China. Within months, nationalist leader Sun Yat-sen, who had organized earlier unsuccessful uprisings against the imperial dynasty's rule, would now take office as the elected provisional president of the new Republic of China. These historic events marked the birth of a new era for China. For the first time in recorded history, the country was not ruled by an emperor. Sun Yat-sen, the visionary leader who helped bring about these dramatic changes, was born in 1866 into a peasant family in southern China. As a young man, he briefly practiced medicine in Hong Kong. But Sun's real interests lay elsewhere. He soon embarked on what would become the defining mission of his life to free China from the grip of the corrupt and incompetent ruling Manchu dynasty, headed by the Empress Dowager Su Shi. 
Sun's dream was to establish a modern democratic state free from foreign imperialism and control. After Sun participated in a failed revolt against the Manchu dynasty in 1895, he went into exile. For the next 16 years, Sun traveled the globe, speaking eloquently about the need for radical democratic reforms in China. In 1905, Sun articulated the core ideas at the heart of his vision for a new China, which he called the three principles of the people. The three principles were nationalism, democracy, and the livelihood of the people. But Sun's repeated attempts to incite rebellion in China met with failure until the revolt at Wuchang erupted on October 10, 1911, and quickly spread across the country. Sun returned to China, and on January 1, 1912, he took office as the provisional president of the republic. But Sun was quickly forced to give up his position to the powerful northern warlord Yuan Shikai in order to avoid nationwide civil war. In 1913, when Yuan Shikai betrayed the Republic and moved to make himself emperor, Sun fled to Japan, where he reorganized the Nationalist Party, or Gumindong, under his personal control. Finally, in 1921, Sun established a Republican government in Canton, though it controlled only a limited area in southern China. By 1924, Sun's government was receiving support from Communist Russia in the form of money, military equipment, and training. In return for this Russian aid, Sun agreed to allow the Chinese Communist Party into his government. In 1925, while on a mission to achieve his dream of national unification, Sun Yat-sen died of cancer in Beijing. Sun's protege, Chiang Kai-shek, rose to power after Sun's death and began a decades-long battle with the communists led by his arch-rival, Mao Zedong, to determine who would control China. By 1949, the communists had gained the advantage, and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist army was on the brink of defeat. Zhang and his remaining forces left mainland China and escaped to the island of Taiwan, where they established a new government. On the mainland, the victorious communist regime, called the People's Republic of China, was officially proclaimed on October 1st, 1949. The pioneering work of Sun Yat-sen helped bring about tremendous change in China. Sun's courageous efforts to create a modern democratic state led to the historic end of the rule of the imperial dynasties. But Sun's decision to allow the communists into his government gave them a foothold in China that ultimately helped them take power. Today, Sun Yat-sen is revered in both China and Taiwan and remembered as the first great leader of modern China. December 14, 1911, Raoul Amundsen won a dramatic polar race when he became the first person to reach the South Pole. The race had begun 18 months earlier. Robert Perry's discovery of the North Pole had electrified the world in 1909. Amundsen, now sailed from Norway, determined to conquer the South Pole. At about the same time, the British explorer Robert Scott sailed from England bound for the same destination. Both parties arrived in Antarctica in January of 1911. Before the Antarctic winter set in, both Amundsen and Scott deposited stores of food along the route that would later be taken to the pole. The deciding difference between the two teams proved to be the manner of transport. Amundsen relied on dog teams and sledges, while Scott used Siberian ponies. Amundsen started for the pole on October 20, 1911, with four companions, 52 dogs, and four sledges, taking enough food for four months. The weather was favorable, and all went well. On December 14, 1911, celestial observations confirmed that they had reached the South Pole. Meanwhile, Scott's five-member team left their camp 11 days after Amundsen. Their Siberian ponies proved to be ill-suited for the snowy surface, forcing Scott and his men to drag their supplies on sledges. Exhausted, they reached the pole 35 days after Amundsen and were disheartened when they found the Norwegian flag flying. 
Weakened by shortages of food, the extremely low temperatures, and the effects of hauling their own supplies, Scott's return trip would end in disaster. First, a man died after a serious fall. A month later, a second member, who was badly frostbitten and aware that he was hampering his comrades, walked out into a driving snowstorm in a supreme act of self-sacrifice. Finally, within miles of a well-stocked depot, they were forced to stop and pitch a tent during a massive blizzard. Six months later, the bodies of Scott and his men were found in a snowed up tent on the Antarctic ice. Scott's last diary entry is haunting. We are getting weaker and the end cannot be far. It seems a pity, but I do not think I can write anymore. The courage and sacrifice of both teams opened a new chapter in man's discovery and understanding of the world. Unfortunately, the most dramatic story in Antarctic polar exploration ended in tragedy, as well as triumph. April 14, 1912, shortly before midnight, off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, the largest and most sumptuously appointed vessel that had ever put to sea steamed towards disaster. On its maiden voyage, the SS Titanic collided with an iceberg in the North Atlantic, sending more than 1,500 to an icy death. The liner had sailed from Southampton, England, only four days earlier, bound for New York City. Its vast ballrooms and sprawling upper decks cradled the cream of English and American high society. At a time when an average yearly salary was less than $1,000, first-class passengers paid well over $4,000 for the trip. Despite urgent warning of dangerous conditions that night, the ship's captain arrogantly maintained the Titanic speed as it plowed headlong into an ice field. Most of the passengers were apparently unaware of the accident when it happened. When the giant 46,000 ton ship brushed an iceberg for a mere 10 seconds, it was barely enough of a touch to spill a glass of champagne. But when Thomas Andrews, the engineer who had overseen the building of the Titanic, rushed starboard, he found a 300 foot gash along the hull, open to the sea. Although the ship had been outfitted with every luxury imaginable, Lifeboats had not been considered important. The ship was thought to be unsinkable, and there were no lifeboats available for half the people on board. The liner remained afloat for two hours and 40 minutes after the impact. Although there was a ship passing nearby, it made no attempt to rescue the sinking vessel. Its radio operator had gone off duty for the night, and the Titanic's desperate calls for help went unheard. Of the 2,222 passengers and crew on the Titanic, only 705 survived, mostly women and children. As a result of the disaster, international maritime safety rules were changed. 24-hour radio monitoring became mandatory, and adequate lifeboat space is now required for passengers and crews of all ships. Almost 75 years later, an international team of oceanographers located the Titanic, resting in several pieces two miles down on the ocean floor. Items retrieved from the expedition went on display as a tribute to the 1,500 lives lost and as a grim reminder of the worst shipwreck in world history. October 10, 1913. One of the greatest engineering feats in history was officially completed with the opening of the Panama Canal. The waters of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans were joined when President Woodrow Wilson pushed a button in Washington, exploding dynamite that destroyed the final barrier between the two bodies of water. The achievement fulfilled a centuries-old dream of reducing the 7,000-mile-long voyage around Cape Horn. After the explorer Balboa crossed the width of Panama in 1513 and discovered that only a 50-mile-wide strip of land separated the Atlantic from the Pacific, 
the possibility of constructing a canal that would connect the oceans seemed feasible. Through the years, such varied and distinguished people as Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and Simon Bolivar had been advocates of a canal. A Frenchman, Ferdinand de Lesseps, was the first to undertake construction of a canal. He had directed the building of the Suez Canal and was the premier canal builder of his time. At the time, Panama was a province of Colombia. De Lesseps organized a private company and obtained digging rights in Panama from the government of Colombia. He began construction in February of 1881. The prohibitive costs of cutting through the hard rock of the Continental Divide had not been foreseen by the engineer, who had built a canal through the sand dunes of Suez. Other problems contributed to his ultimate failure, particularly epidemics of malaria and yellow fever that had struck down a large part of the European labor force. The company went bankrupt in 1889, and construction on the canal was abandoned. Through the years, various attempts were made to salvage the ambitious plan. Problems moving the Navy between oceans during the Spanish-American War of 1898 convinced the United States of the strategic military importance of a canal across the isthmus. One of the major forces behind the project was President Teddy Roosevelt, who formed the commission to study alternate Central American routes. It was finally agreed to follow the basic path of the unfinished French Canal. With Roosevelt's encouragement, there was a revolt in the province of Panama in 1904, which resulted in its independence from Colombia. Shortly thereafter, a treaty was signed with the new country of Panama, which allowed the U.S. to build the Panama Canal. Using a labor force that at times reached 40,000 men, construction began later that year. The equivalent of $660 million was paid to the French company for its initial work. $165 million was paid to Panama for construction rights, with an additional amount to be paid to the country every year thereafter. The treaty granted to the United States, in perpetuity, complete jurisdiction over a strip of land 10 miles wide across the isthmus, which became known as the Canal Zone. The U.S. government soon faced the same obstacles that had stymied the French. The engineering plan was eventually changed to a lock design that precluded cutting through large stretches of rock. The canal could not have been completed, however, without the work of medical science. After it was discovered that malaria and yellow fever were carried by mosquitoes, both diseases were virtually eradicated from the canal zone. Even so, more than 6,000 workers died during the 10 years it took to build the canal. Decades of brewing dissatisfaction over the terms of the treaty came to a head in 1964 when Panamanian rioters clashed with U.S. troops. It was to take 15 more years of painful and painstaking negotiations to arrive at a new agreement. In 1979, a new treaty became effective that gave sovereignty of the canal to the country of Panama. More than 80 years after it was completed, the Panama Canal is still one of the greatest engineering achievements in the world. June 28, 1914. Archduke Francis Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, and his wife Sophie, were assassinated by a Serbian nationalist while visiting the Bosnian town of Sarajevo near the border of Serbia. This event was the spark that would ignite World War I and cause millions to meet untimely deaths. At first, no one could imagine that Europe would soon be destroying its wealth and manhood over this incident. But the unthinkable did happen due to imperial rivalries, entangling alliances, and mutual mistrust. Austria, awaiting a pretext for suppressing Slavic nationalism, declared war on Serbia. Germany did not want war, but their alliance with Austria made them an unwilling accomplice. When Kaiser Wilhelm II heard that Russia was mobilizing its army to help defend their fellow Slavs in Serbia, he telegraphed his cousin, Tsar Nicholas II, and told him to delay the order and help prevent a great power's war in Europe. The Tsar considered doing this, but was told by his ministers that the momentum of a great army in mobilization 
is like a great machine at full speed and that it could not be stopped without incalculable damage. Nearly one and a half million Russians began to march west. The news of Russia's full mobilization fixed Europe's fate. The Kaiser gave the order to mobilize the German army and 500,000 men marched east to fight. The Germans demanded that the French stay neutral. The leaders of the French army railed against this challenge, not only because of their rather vague alliance with the Russians, but because they wanted to avenge their humiliating loss to the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Cooler heads in the French government appealed to England and asked them to declare their support for France. The French believed that if the British made an immediate declaration to the Germans that England was aligned with France, there would not be a war. Unfortunately, the British vacillated, and another opportunity to avert war was lost. On August 1st, the French began mobilization. Two days later, Germany declared war on France, and over a million and a half men marched toward a collision course on the French border. The fastest and easiest way for the German invasion force to reach France was to march through the small, neutral country of Belgium. Germany demanded free passage, but Belgium defied mighty Germany and warned that any violation of its borders would be resisted. The resulting slaughter of the Belgian army and the massacre of innocent civilians would forever turn the tide of world sympathy away from Imperial Germany. The British may have been indifferent to the Austrian-Russian battle for dominance in the Balkans, but they did not want to see Germany, undoubtedly the strongest power on the continent, moving through Belgium into France. On August 4th, the British gave Germany an ultimatum. Halt your advance through Belgium, or we will be at war by midnight. They were at war the next day. Within a short time, all of the major powers in the world would be engaged in the bloodiest war the world had yet seen. By the end of the war, over 10 million people, a whole generation would be wiped out and Europe would be in ruins. And incredible as it may seem, it all began when the Archduke and his wife were gunned down in Sarajevo on June 28, 1914. January 25th, 1915. Alexander Graham Bell speaks into a mouthpiece in New York, and his voice travels across the nation to San Francisco, where Thomas Watson, his longtime collaborator, hears him. For this first transcontinental phone call, Bell repeats the words he spoke to Watson almost 40 years earlier when together they built an ingenious device that revolutionized human communication, the telephone. Alexander Graham Bell, an emigrant from Scotland whose mother and wife were both deaf, had a lifelong fascination with the human voice. He journeyed to Boston and in 1872, at the age of 25, he founded a school for deaf children and began creating devices to help people hear. His experiment with an apparatus called the harmonic telegraph convinced him that an electrical wire connecting a transmitter to a receiver could carry different vibrations of sound, even sound as unique in tone and range as the human voice. To craft precision parts for his idea, Bell hired Thomas Watson, an electrical machinist by trade. Bell's eccentric ideas fired up Watson. Watson's engineering expertise inspired Bell. Years later, Thomas Watson recalls this creative partnership. The telephone. I remember my surprise when he first told me that he expected soon to be able to talk by telegraph, explaining to me his conception of an electric current that would copy the vibrations of speech. Had... On March 10th, 1876, Watson delivered a transmitter to Bell powered by a battery. This early film dramatizes what happened next. 
on the top floor of number five Exeter Place, Watson hurried down the hall to the room where he'd set up his receiver. There, he listened. But as Bell was about to speak into the new instrument, a motion of his arm upset over his clothes a battery jar of acidulated water. In the excitement of the accident, Bell called out to me, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. The big mouthpiece picked up his call for help and I heard every word of it through the receiver at my ear. The new transmitter was better than we had expected or had dared hope. A few months after this accident, Bell and Watson produced a telephone to demonstrate at the 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. Away from the crowds, Bell spoke into his transmitter. On the exhibition floor, Dom Pedro, the emperor of Brazil, exclaimed, My God, it talks! Bell and Watson, unknown inventors from Boston, dazzled the public with their invention. By October, they were able to conduct the first two-way conversation. Watson in a factory in Cambridgeport, and Bell two miles away in Boston. The first switchboard was installed in New Haven the following year. Soon after, lightweight copper wire replaced iron, making suspended phone lines possible. The rapidly expanding Bell Telephone Company turned west, connecting with Chicago by 1892. Phone lines stretched further. The goal, a transcontinental service. But in Denver, engineers met with an obstacle. The signal from New York grew weak, and voices became barely audible. Thicker wires were used, but the problem persisted. Then, in 1906, an amplifier was invented, eventually boosting signals loud enough to reach the far west. By 1915, the long-anticipated transcontinental link had been made. Bell, in New York, telephoned Watson in San Francisco. And even when he spoke into a reproduction of his first telephone, his voice brought clearly to me the words of that now historic first sentence, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. In the years to come, the telephone, along with the telegraph, transformed the battlefields of World War I, tying command posts to trenches instantly. By the 1920s, the telephone had become a common piece of household furniture, and phone lines crisscrossed the nation. Launching an era of global communication, Bell and Watson could only dream of. On the evening of April 24th, 1915, in the city of Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, hundreds of Armenian community leaders were rounded up and later executed by the Turkish government. The ruthless killing of these men was an early harbinger of the wholesale slaughter of the Armenian people, the first genocide or organized mass murder of an ethnic group in the 20th century. Between 1915 and 1918, it is estimated that one million Armenians were killed as part of the barbaric campaign of extermination directed by Turkish authorities. By 1923, after further massacres, hundreds of thousands more Armenians had been killed. The roots of this Holocaust can be traced in part to ethnic and religious tensions arising from the ongoing collapse of the once powerful Ottoman Empire, which had been disintegrating for hundreds of years. In the late 19th century, the empire was ruled by Sultan Abdul Hamid II, also known as the Red Sultan because of his bloody methods. Concerned that Armenian aspirations for more civil rights would grow into an independence movement, the Sultan encouraged a series of massacres that killed between 200 and 500,000 Armenians between 1894 and 1896. The satisfaction mounted with the Sultan's autocratic and corrupt leadership, 
And in 1908, the Sultan was overthrown during the Young Turk Revolution. The Young Turk leaders initially promised equal rights for all minorities in the empire. But in 1913, an ultranationalist group within the movement seized power. It was comprised of men who believed in creating a pure Turkish state that excluded non-Muslim, non-Turkish minorities like the Armenians. Three of these men led the regime and would later be responsible for initiating the Armenian Genocide. They were Enver Pasha, Minister of War, Talat Pasha, Minister of Internal Affairs, and Jamal Pasha, Minister of the Navy. These leaders forged closer ties with Germany, which supplied the Turks with military assistance and training. In 1914, the Ottoman Empire aligned itself with Germany and the Central Powers in World War I, and another justification for liquidating the Armenian population presented itself. The Muslim Turks, who were fighting the Christian Russians in the war, feared that their own Christian Armenian subjects would rise up and fight on the side of the enemy. So the young Turk leadership conceived and set in motion a savage plan to eliminate the Armenian population. Early in 1915, the Turkish government began disarming all Armenians serving in the military, turning many of them into road laborers and pack animals. These men were then worked to death or shot. Sometimes they were made to dig their own graves before being murdered. On the evening of April 24, 1915, the Turkish government launched the next stage of the genocide by eliminating the Armenian cultural and political elite in Istanbul the very men who would have been most likely to have organized the resistance against the genocide. In the months that followed, the Turkish government ordered the deportation of all Armenians from the empire. Under the cover of these so-called deportations, thousands of mostly women, children, and elderly Armenians were forced to leave their homes and travel hundreds of miles on foot. Though many of these Armenian refugees perished from disease and lack of food and water, others were viciously killed by butcher battalions. These bands, part of a secret government-formed group called the Special Organization, were made up of criminals and murderers and were employed to massacre the exhausted and defenseless refugees. The Special Organization's methods were savage and barbaric. They raped, stole, and often used swords to hack their victims to death. Younger Armenian women were sometimes kidnapped and sold into bondage in Muslim and Turkish homes. Countless other Armenians were hanged, shot, even burned to death during the Turks' murderous rampage. Armenian babies were thrown against walls, and older children were poisoned to death. Even their churches were reduced to rubble. The relatively small number of Armenians who survived the death marches and reached northern Syria were rounded up in squalid camps and then dispatched into the desert to die. The American ambassador to Turkey, Henry Morgenthau, was horrified by the atrocities going on around him. Morgenthau helped publicize the genocide in America, which led to the formation of the Near East Relief Committee. Near East Relief raised funds and set up medical and educational facilities for the survivors of the Holocaust, eventually saving tens of thousands of Armenian lives. After World War I ended in defeat for Turkey, a new government took power and conducted trials which sentenced the former Turkish leaders to death for their atrocities. But they had long since fled the country. The principal mastermind behind the Armenian slaughter, Talat Pasha, was eventually assassinated in Berlin in 1921 by Armenian activists. Tragically, the short pause in the slaughter of Armenians ended when a new nationalist Turkish movement led by Kemal Ataturk started a series of military campaigns between 1920 and 1923 that resulted in the decimation of the remaining Armenians in the region. The new Turkish Republic, founded in 1923, began an official policy of denying the genocide ever took place, a denial which the current Turkish government continues to this day. In the years following the mass killing of the Armenians, the world seemed to forget about the genocide. This amnesia would soon embolden another dictator, Adolf Hitler. In justifying his own murderous rampage, Hitler once said, who still speaks of the extermination of the Armenians? Tens of thousands of Armenians escaped the genocide and settled in countries all over the world where their descendants still live today. Many others fled to Russian Armenia, 
an area which would become a part of the Soviet Union. Since voting to declare their independence from the former Soviet Union on September 21st, 1991, Armenians have once again had their own country. Armenians the world over now annually commemorate April 24th as a day to remember the victims of the century's first genocide. Despite the condemnation of millions of people in many nations around the world, Turkey still has not acknowledged its dark past. July 1st, 1916. At 7.28 a.m., nearly 400,000 British and French troops climbed up from their trenches and headed across no man's land. Their goal, to attack the German army entrenched along the Somme River in France. This marked the beginning of the Battle of the Sun, a monstrous struggle that would last months and shake the world with its bloody carnage and, in the end, its utter futility. The Allied High Command convinced their respective governments that the best way to end the stalemate on the Western Front and win the war was to mount a great offensive. They would attack the center of one of the best fortified German positions on the front. It was a foolhardy decision that would end in catastrophe. The incredibly destructive and accurate firepower of new weapons like the machine gun and the long-range cannon made the mass infantry bayonet charges of earlier wars obsolete. Unfortunately, this fact had still not been learned by the Allied High Command. Within the first 15 minutes of the attack, thousands of advancing troops were cut to shreds by the deadly German machine gun fire. By the end of the first day, British casualties alone reached 60,000. Over 19,000 lay dead or mortally wounded. The fighting raged on for months. On September 15th, the British launched a general attack on a 10-mile front and used tanks on the battlefield for the first time. Although there were too few tanks to make much of a difference, their potential was noted. Back in Britain, with the true picture of the battle emerging, there was much public protest about the way the war was being fought. There was also a growing anti-war movement. On a political level, one direct result of the disastrous Sum campaign was a change in the leadership of the coalition government. David Lloyd George was appointed the new prime minister, and a new cabinet was announced, including the presence of a young Winston Churchill. Back on the battlefield, the Allies had conquered about 125 square miles of territory, but nothing of great strategic importance. On November 18th, the Battle of the Somme ended with British losses at a staggering 400,000 men. The French lost almost 200,000. Though German casualties were nearly as high, it did not lessen the pain and sense of loss felt in England and France. When the Allies set out on July 1st, 1916, they had intended to win the Battle of the Somme and the war. But the battle only showed how difficult this was going to be. The bloody destruction and horror of World War I continued for another two years. March 16, 1917. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Russian Tsar Nicholas II abdicated ending the 300-year-old Romanov dynasty. The Tsar signed the document of relinquishment after months of turmoil and in the midst of a volatile political situation that would soon lead to all-out revolution. As power passed to a provincial government led by Alexander Kerensky, the Tsar himself went to bid a final farewell to his army. Years of misgovernment and a rigid inflexibility led to his demise failures on the battlefield during World War I made the war less and less popular with the masses. Two million men had died in 1915 alone. And by 1917, some nine million troops were either killed, missing, or had died of cold and hunger. And it wasn't only the soldiers who were suffering, the winter of 1917 was extremely cold and starvation was gripping large areas of the country. 
What little food there was, was prevented from reaching the people by bureaucratic incompetence. Workers went on strike, and people took to the streets demanding an end to the war. Troops sent in to deal with the demonstrators refused to obey orders. Just as public support for the war reached its lowest ebb, Nicholas took personal command of the army. It was a fatal mistake. Just when he should have been distancing himself from the disastrous consequences of the war, it appeared to the people that he was approving the conduct of the war. Soon the whole country was in revolt. On November 7th, a coup d'etat led by Vladimir Lenin toppled the provisional government. The Bolsheviks were now in power, and Nicholas II and his family were exiled to Siberia. Within months, Russia would erupt into civil war between the Bolshevik Red Army and the pro-monarchy White Army. Alive, Nicholas was the most serious threat to the legitimacy of the new Bolshevik regime. On July 16, 1918, Nicholas and his family were executed. There was no turning back now. Russia was about to begin 70 years of communist rule. April 6, 1917, the United States declared war on Germany and entered World War I. President Woodrow Wilson asked for the declaration of war, proclaiming that the world must be made safe for democracy. Only the year before, American public opinion about entering the war was still divided, and Wilson was re-elected largely on the slogan, he kept us out of war. Wilson had always felt that the U.S. could be the mediator, but his attempts at negotiating a peace had proved unsuccessful. On January 31, 1917, the United States was informed by Germany that unrestricted submarine warfare would begin on February 1st. Germany said it would sink every vessel that approached Great Britain, Ireland, and some Mediterranean ports. In response, Wilson severed relations with the German government and stated that the new German policy represented a war against all nations. During February and March, several American ships were sunk. British intelligence also intercepted a secret telegram known as the Zimmerman Note that revealed a German offer to Mexico to join in an attack of the U.S. The president now had specific and compelling reasons to declare war on Germany. Wilson would not tolerate full submarine warfare against commercial vessels of neutral nations, especially in light of what had happened to the British passenger ship the Lusitania. On May 7, 1915, at 2.15 p.m., the Lusitania was struck on the starboard side by a torpedo fired from a German U-boat. A huge explosion ensued. The engine stopped, and the crew tried to lower the lifeboats. But minutes later, a second torpedo hit the engine room. This was the fatal blow. Some survivors donned life belts and jumped into the ocean. Others crowded into the remaining lifeboats. Within 18 minutes, the Lusitania had sunk into the ocean's depths. Of a total of 1,906 passengers and crew, 1,198 innocent people were lost, including 128 Americans. This animation was created and shown to the public in movie theaters in order to gain support for entering the war. A wave of resentment against Germany swept over the United States, which influenced its later entry into the war. The German government expressed no regret over the incident and asserted that American citizens had been warned in U.S. newspapers not to sail to Great Britain. They also claimed that the ship was secretly carrying arms and munitions to England. This was vehemently denied by the British. Ironically, Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare, though very effective, may have ultimately cost them the war. Their continued assault on unarmed American commercial ships brought the U.S. into a war that it had desperately tried to avoid. Soon, the nearly unlimited might of the largest industrial power in the world and millions of determined young American men would tip the scales against Germany and the Central Powers. On April 6, 1917, the U.S. did more than declare war. 
It declared that it was now a global power with the will and the strength to assert its convictions anywhere in the world. November 11, 1918. At 11 a.m., fighting ceased on the Western Front, and the whole world breathed a sigh of relief. The nightmare of World War I was finally over. The Germans signed an armistice at 5 a.m., and the ceasefire took effect six hours later. In cities all over the globe, ecstatic people celebrated the end of the bloody five-year war. In March, the Germans had mustered all of their resources and manpower for one last all-out offensive on the Western Front. The Kaiser called it the decisive moment of the war. And at first, the Germans achieved some great results. General Ferdinand Foch was appointed commander of Allied armies on the Western Front. On June 30th, he launched a powerful counterattack, which pushed the Germans back. On November 3rd, Austria-Hungary surrendered. The empire that started the war by trying to annex the tiny nation of Serbia would soon itself be reduced to two small countries, Austria and Hungary. After that, the collapse of Germany was certain. Germany had run out of manpower, food, and supplies due to the Allied naval blockade. On November 9th, the Kaiser abdicated his throne and fled to neutral Holland. Germany surrendered. General Foch laid down the terms of the armistice. Germany was required to give up its heavy guns and aircraft, 5,000 trucks, 5,000 train engines, and 150,000 railroad cars. Their large warships and most of their U-boats were to be docked at Allied ports. German troops in Austria-Hungary, Romania, Turkey, and Russia were ordered to lay down their arms and return home at once and any German-occupied territory west of the Rhine was to be evacuated. French troops moved in to occupy Strasbourg, while British and American troops began the occupation of Germany. Though its economy was left in ruins, Germany did not have to rebuild its cities like so many other European nations. The cost of the war was staggering. More than 10 million were killed, 21 million wounded, 7.5 million taken prisoner or missing in action. The total gross cost of the war was estimated at over $232 trillion. At a peace conference in Paris on June 28, 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed by 70 delegates representing 27 of the victorious countries. President Wilson succeeded in getting the delegates to create a League of Nations as part of the General Peace Treaty. Wilson was the first Allied leader to sign the treaty Ironically, Wilson could not get the U.S. Senate to ratify the agreement. The U.S. would never join the League. The treaty imposed severe punishments on Germany, including enormous reparations to be paid, restrictions on its military, and the loss of considerable territory. Critics of the treaty warned it could cause serious resentment among the German people, which could lead to even bigger problems with Germany in the future. Nonetheless, the war was over and the Allies had won. The last shot of World War I was fired on November 11, 1918. Joyous citizens everywhere celebrated, and the world held new hope for lasting peace. Eventually, Armistice Day would evolve into the holiday Veterans Day, a time when Americans remember all of those who gave their lives in war. The world became a battlefield during the 1910s, bringing an end to the Edwardian summer. But the Great War ended, and as the decade drew to a close, the Roaring Twenties sprang to life. During the Twenties, people would begin to turn their attention back to innovation and exploration, resulting in unheard of achievements. The invention of television and talking movies, the first solo transatlantic flight, and the discovery of penicillin. But there was also strife, corruption, and disaster. And like every decade, the 1920s would challenge the lifestyles and ideas of the decade left behind. <laughs>